Hello everyone, the Green Scorpion here, and let it never be said that I don't read my comments. This week, we'll be looking at the Axe, the most requested weapon since the first Weapons Month. Like most weapons, the Axe started out as a tool. It was designed to chop wood by combining a sharpened edge with an added angular momentum of the handle. It just so happens that the design also works wonders for chopping necks. In works of fiction, Axes are vicious, bloodthirsty, and often caked red. The team member with the axe is usually the heavy hitter, the berserker, the one who prefers strength over style. And considering how heavy axes can be compared to swords and spears, you won't see anyone on this list without serious upper body strength. A few other character types tend to emerge around this weapon based on its original use. Popular archetypes of the axe include lumberjacks or woodsmen who use their weapons to survive in nature, or pyromaniacs who make like firefighters fighters to chop through burning buildings. And of course, the Executioner with his arms and blades standing in for a guillotine. But let's cut to the chase. These are the top 10 greatest video game axe wielders. Same rules apply, only games I've played and only one per franchise. Alright, let's do this. There are a lot of Robot Masters in the Mega Man series, and the developers had no shortage of ideas. Cut Man, Charge Man, Blade Man, Clown Man, Gyro Man, Sheep Man... The list goes on. Probably my favorites were the 8 from Mega Man 6. If you bother to listen to the game's story, Mega Man 6 involves an international Robot Masters tournament where different countries send their best automatons. But the nefarious Dr. Wily reprogrammed the tournament's finalists, forcing Mega Man to take down such bosses as Flame Man, Yamato Man, Night Man, Centaur Man, and the coolest of all, Tomahawk Man. Stereotypical Native American, sure, there's just something cool about him. Maybe it's the name, maybe it's that he has an axe for a hand. Once you get into the battle, though, you realize that all he does is shoot feathers and throw with a spinning axe. But hey, a new axe grows on his arm every time. And unlike most Robot Masters that were made for construction or maintenance, Tomahawk Man and his Mega Man 6 peers were made to do battle. Not much I can say, it's just cool. Coming in at number 9, we have a dwarf with probably the most dwarven name imaginable. This is Gilius Thunderhead from Golden Axe. Though nowadays it's gone the way of Vector Man, Golden Axe was an immensely popular beat-em-up in the arcades in the early 16-bit era. And as it so happens, Gilius is the only character in the game to wield an axe. Even the blue Speedo Man, whose name is actually Axe Battler, uses a sword. Though it's been more than a decade since Gilius and the gang did battle with the forces of Death Adder and those annoying little gnomes, Gilius keeps himself busy as the face of the series in several Sega get-togethers. He made his comeback in Sega Superstar Tennis, where he occasionally trades in his racket for his trusty axe. How's that for putting a slice on the ball? He sets his weapon down for Sonic All-Stars Racing Transform, where he races fair and square on land, air, and sea, until he gets frustrated and starts chucking hatchets at everyone in front of him. Doesn't matter where this guy goes, he's always ready to chop some heads. This should surprise no one. Ranked number 24 in the UAA, Matt Helms is an assassin to be feared. I can see how he kills people, but I'm not sure who would hire him. So the story goes, he was an abandoned child that died and made a deal with a devil to live forever. And he is creepy as all hell. He's got the kid's voice, the creepy mask, he's built like a linebacker, and his weapon is a domestic marvel, a flamethrower with an axe blade mounted on the nozzle. I think part of what makes this battle work is the location. Matt Helms meets his opponents in the abandoned cabin that belonged to his parents. The entire place is wooden, so not only can he burn it down with Molotov cocktails and jets of flame, he can rip through all the clutter with a single swing, which gives Travis a lot of trouble if he's trying to keep his distance. Matt has a horrifying love for destruction, and if Travis kept hiding, I bet Matt would just burn away the house until it fell down on the two of them. I mean, he's immortal, so what does he care? He may only be the 24th ranked assassin, but he's number one when it comes to creepy. Well, maybe number two, depending on how you feel about Chloe Walsh.
When Mario is recovering the star pieces and Smithy wants to stop him, Smithy calls in the Axum Rangers. These five metal-crafted menaces may be a parody of the Power Rangers, but they spend a lot of their time bickering. But they aren't slouches. And true, I probably shouldn't include all five of them for this spot, but the whole here is greater than the sum of the Technicolor parts. Let's look at them each individually. Red is the leader and the second strongest. He tends to focus more on simple axe swings to take Mario down a peg, but he can cast Vigor up on himself to really deal some damage. He might be a real threat if he didn't have to expend most of his energy keeping his teammates in check. Black is the fastest of the group, issuing multiple attacks before any of the others get a chance. He also throws in some bombs to keep things interesting. Pink, being the token girl, is of course their healer. Her attack power is cotton, but her mega recover spell makes her the best one to take out first. Green also has a really weak swing, but he can cast some pretty powerful magic, including Meteor Shower. And Yellow, the fat one, has more physical strength than the rest, but it's not until he's taken some hits that he really starts throwing his weight around. Between the five of them, the Axum Rangers have the makings of a great warrior. They got smarts, skill, speed, strength, and sustainability. But as five, they can be picked off one by one. Luckily, Red has a backup plan. A Megazord. This powerful cannon fires on Mario and his partners for devastating results. Did I mention that their airship, the Blade, is a giant axe? The Smithy Gang really takes its weapons theme seriously. This next one is a bit precarious, but let's look at the Barbarian from Diablo. This character class appeared in both Diablo 2 and Diablo 3. But let's focus on Diablo 3 since I haven't gotten to play Diablo 2 yet. The Barbarian here isn't the typical Barbarian trope we think of, at least not entirely. He is depicted as an elderly man in the artwork, but very, very strong, wizened by his time in the wilderness. The Barbarian clan protects their home mountain and the magical secrets it holds from the demonic forces of hell. Their fighting style is very strength based, yes, but also spiritual. They are far from stupid, and when it comes to the dungeon crawling, they are quite literally a force of nature. The Barbarian does not exclusively use an axe, however. He is also proficient in spears, swords, maces, and daggers. It all depends on how you build him. However, his natural brawniness and his many crowd control skills lend him to heavier weapons, and to me, the axe is the best fit. While playing the Witch Doctor or the Demon Hunter encourages you to keep your distance and avoid being surrounded, the Barbarian is right at home in the middle of the demonic dogpile. He can shrug off most any blow, and his area of effect swings like Seismic Slam, Earthquake, and Whirlwind make throwing off dozens of little imps a joy to behold. His light attacks can quickly dispatch hordes of undead, and his heavier attacks make him a pro at tanking the big guys. Let the fury flow. Playing his encore for Weapons Month, it's Eddie Riggs. We've talked about Eddie from Brutal Legend before, so I won't go through his whole story again. We acknowledge his battle prowess with his trusty bass guitar, Clementine. He melts faces, electrocutes people, and summons giant flaming zeppelins. But Clementine is only half of the roadie's main arsenal. The other half is his battle axe, the Separator. Eddie doesn't really prefer one over the other either, and many of his combos use the two weapons in conjunction. Let's look at the Separator itself. There is no other word for it but metal! The two-sided axe originally belonged to Sukuria, a powerful demon warrior and emperor of the Tainted Coil. Eddie finds it in the temple and, in a very Arthurian fashion, the blade deems Eddie worthy of wielding it. During his journey, Eddie can upgrade his axe at motor forges using what are known as axe treatments. These include eternal fire to envelop the axe in flame, soul sucking to restore Eddie's health when he kills enemies, bloodlust, which makes it basically the Islander from Team Fortress 2, Chain Lightning, and best of all, Steel Quilled. This treatment causes spikes to shoot out of the axe as Eddie swings, which embed themselves into infantry and explode on death. Eddie commands hundreds of hangbangers in battle, but he's the one that the enemy really needs to worry about. He'll chop them to pieces and play a wicked bass solo at the same time, leaving those sorry wannabes in the dust. Crashing into the number 4 spot is Astaroth from the Soul Calibur games. 
I thought about including Lizard Man instead, but come on. This is Astroth we're talking about. Look at the size of him! Look at the size of his axe! It's a freaking tree! Is he trying to compensate for something? Well, actually, he kind of is. Astroth is a golem made by a Grand Priest by Order of Ares. Yes, that Ares. Commanded by the God of War to collect Soul Edge, Astaroth left nothing but destruction in his wake, even indirectly killing Maxi's brother on the way. In the background, however, a power struggle between the priest and the god led to different forces possessing Astaroth on his journey, and he was often sidetracked on missions to kill the priest. Astaroth would eventually learn that he was but a copy of the legendary White Giant, and decided that he wasn't all too happy about being a pawn of Ares. Mm-hmm, that's right. Astaroth is the original Kratos. Though who really pays attention to the story anyway. Let's look at the combat. Astaroth is 6'8 and 287 pounds. That is until his new model is wheeled out of Soul Calibur 5. Then he is 7'2 and 403 pounds. He's a big guy, and that's all muscle. So when he clobbers someone with an axe the size of a telephone pole, it hurts. He's the most extreme case of a slow but strong fighter. He's also got the reach to hit even Killick from a safe distance, and enough throws and knockbacks to keep his enemies away. Astroth can be a hard character to master, but fighting against one is always stressful, since one clean hit can send your life bar plummeting and your body careening off an edge. And with his critical finish in Soul Calibur 4, he can literally mop the floor with you. <laughs> So here's why I think the axe was so requested for Weapons Month. Fire Emblem. In Fire Emblem, there are four main categories of physical weapons. The weapon triangle of sword, lance, and axe, and the ranged bow. Three of these weapons were done last year for Weapons Month, and all three of those lists had Fire Emblem characters on them. So fans may be wondering who I think is the best axe wielder in the series. Well, I don't know, there's some great choices. Personally, I got a lot of mileage out of Ike's childhood rival Boyd. There's also Ross from Sacred Stones, who with enough effort can become one of the three axe-touting juggernauts. There's also Grail, but he didn't last too long. Finally, I had to consider what fighter or berserker was absolutely integral to his party. The answer was right there in front of me. Hector, King of Ostia. While American fans will recognize Hector from the original Fire Emblem, Japanese fans first met the blue-haired brigand a year earlier in Fire Emblem Sword of Seals. Hector only plays a brief role, but he is something of a foster father to Roy. He's also, oddly enough, a general class, meaning he can use the axe on a chain. It wasn't until the first US Fire Emblem, sometimes known as Blazing Sword, when Hector got some real face time in the prequel. While most lords of the franchise are of the sword-swinging variety, Hector prefers a two-handed war axe, and his personality reflects his weapon choice. He can act noble, being in line for the throne after his brother, and if a conflict arises, he will attempt diplomacy. But he won't be distraught if he has to split some skulls. In fact, he's kind of hoping for it. This makes him a great foil to the game's fellow protagonists. He and Lin often insult each other's tactics, which is funny since the two can actually get married at the end of the game. And though Elowood is meant to be the main hero, being Roy's father and all, Hector makes his best friend look positively scrawny. Hector's starting axe, the Wolf Bale, grants him extra damage against all mounted and armored units, and his offensive and defensive stats are ridiculous. You need someone to intercept some incoming cavalry? He's your guy. You need someone to one-shot a general? He's your guy. Need someone to tank archers while throwing hatchets like they're boomerangs? He's your guy. Things get even better when he's upgraded to a great lord and wields the legendary Armat. The weapon carries a prophecy that he who wields the weapon will not die peacefully, but fall in battle. Foreboding, yes, but I don't think Hector would have it any other way. With a few years and a great beard, he becomes a righteous king. Noble, brash, and absurdly powerful, Hector to me represents all of the qualities of an axe wielder. So, we've had a lot of big muscled men, some robots, and a golem. 
Fair enough, since it takes so much strength to use such a weighted weapon with any real precision. But for variety's sake, let's look at a 12-year-old girl. This is Prisea Combatir from Tales of Symphonia, and that hatchet she's carrying is just as tall as she is and nearly twice her weight. Prisea is pretty strong for her age. The daughter of a lumberjack, Prisea wanted to take over her father's work when he was injured. She signed up to be a lab experiment and had a magical x spear planted in her. It worked out well. The jewel gave her Herculean strength and she was able to join the family business. In fact, the first time the party sees her, she casually drags a chopped tree up a set of stairs with one arm, just as the entire rest of the party struggled to move it a few inches. Because the x spear wasn't properly balanced with a key crest, however, it had some nasty side effects. For one, it slowed Persea's aging to a crawl. Though she is biologically 12, chronologically she's 28 years old. It also left her devoid of all emotions. She soon sank into a robotic routine, neglecting to notice that her father had long passed away and his corpse lay uncared for in his bed. With a new quest for revenge and reconstitution, Persea joins the party. And are they lucky to have her? Oh yeah. Not just because Genus is constantly crushing over her, no. I mean because she can dish out more damage and take more abuse than any other party member in the game. She's also easily the slowest, but considering her disposition, she has a surprising talent for jumping over enemies. She also has a few arts, or special moves, but they live up to their names. Punishment, Infliction, and Devastation. There's also my favorite, Destruction, which pounds the ground to deal earth damage. What makes this move so great is that Prisea is unable to do any magic. That's not Terra Magic making those rocks move. Prisea is striking the ground with such force that it liberates stones from their fractures, and these fragments are accelerated fast enough to pelt through human bones. Holy crap! Maybe it's a good thing that she has no emotions. I would not want to see her angry. Alright, let's do the old recap before we get to number 1. Number 10, Tomahawk Man. Number 9, Gilius Thunderhead. Number 8, Matt Helms. Number 7, The Axum Rangers. Number 6, The Barbarian. Number 5, Eddie Riggs. Number 4, Astaroth. Number 3, Hector. And number 2, Prisea Combatier. For number 1, we must once again venture into League of Legends. Riot is releasing new champions every month all with their own unique personalities, backstories, powers, and of course, weapons. Last spring, we saw the release of one of the most fearsome solo top champions in recent memory. Darius, the Hand of Noxus. For those of you unfamiliar, Noxus is one of the many city-states of Ruterra, a longtime enemy of the more upstanding Demacia. It is home to some of the most violent, corrupt, evil men and women in the realm, and when there's a war, Noxus is usually around for it. The city-state has a long history of civil dispute, and though some Noxians like Riven can retain their honor, none thrive in Noxus without compromising some moral integrity. Enter Darius, who scourged for his existence in the streets and fought in the military until one fateful battle against Demacia. Darius' captain called for a retreat, but Darius, seeing more than defeat, beheaded his captain and led the rest of the team to victory. Darius rose through the ranks of Noxus in a similarly violent manner, and is now the right-hand man to King Jericho Swain. Darius can be seen as the anti-version of Garen, the vanguard of Demacia, in both personality and with his similar, though much more ruthless, fighting style. Darius is a slow walker, but a great mix of tank and damage dealer. His passive ability, Hemorrhage, causes all of his attacks to inflict extra bleeding damage to opponents and his other abilities gain more power if the target is bleeding. If a desperate opponent starts to escape Darius, he is not one to give chase. Rather, he uses the hook on the back of his giant axe to pull the pitiful fools back in. And his ultimate, dear god, Noxian Guillotine. Darius jumps in the air with a mighty executioner swing, dealing massive amounts of true damage that ignores any armor or shielding. Even worse, if Noxian Guillotine is the killing blow to an enemy champion, the cooldown is instantly refreshed, meaning that he can immediately use it again. It is not uncommon to see Darius in team fights jumping up and down like he's got the hammer of Super Smash Bros. Brawl, racking up a juicy red pentakill. With his immense sustainability and body count, Darius was a fan favorite as soon as he hit the server, 
and was well on his way to become the most popular of the Noxian champions and making him the number one greatest axe wielder in gaming history. I'm the Green Scorpion, thank you for watching. Until a month later when Darius' brother showed up. We're not done with this list just yet. Enter Draven, the Glorious Executioner. He has all of Darius' affinity for bloodshed and, if you can believe it, even less restraint. So who actually takes the number one spot? They both do, and rightly so. I just talked about Darius, so now let's look at Draven. He makes his brother look perfectly composed. Unlike his bruiser top lane sibling, Draven is an attack damage carry, meaning that despite less defenses, his damage output grows exponentially as he levels, making it essential that he goes for the kills early. Draven could never be the respected blood knight that Darius was, having more flair for the dramatic and a greater need for attention. He instead became an executioner, where he transformed the proceedings into a sporting event. If the prisoners could escape Draven's axes, they could roam free. They never did. Draven's executions became the hottest ticket in Noxus, and soon Draven's insatiable appetite for fame led him to the League as well. Draven also uses the bleeding system. Unlike Darius with his one giant axe, Draven uses... Wait, what the heck are those? Those aren't axes, are they? Well, the game says they are. By definition, an axe has to have a head and a handle. These crazy things have a handle, but the blade can swivel around the circular handle sort of like a propeller. Well, I guess it counts. Riot seems to think so. His signature move, Spinning Blade, has him lob an axe at enemies, causing it to ricochet up in the air. If Draven can position himself to catch the axe on the rebound, his cooldown will be refreshed. This also causes another ability, Blood Rush, to grant him increased movement and attack speed at lower cooldowns. He can be bouncing both of his axes at the same time, and this juggling act can become a game within a game. Stand Aside lets Draven shunt and slow his targets, and his ultimate, Whirling Death, can follow someone halfway across Summoner's Rift. And if it misses, it comes back again for another chance. Despite both using axes, the Noxus brothers are incredibly different and fulfill different roles on the team, and the synergy of their abilities make them perfectly usable together. I know some players might prefer the likes of Olaf as an axe wielder, but I can't think of anyone in the game I would be more afraid of to give an axe to than these brothers. So at the risk of starting the world's bloodiest sibling rivalry, I declare them both the best axe wielders in video games. If you like AD carries, go with Draven. And if you like tanky fighters, go with Darius. And if you like your head on your shoulders, go far, far away. I am the Green Scorpion. Thank you for watching. For real this time.